Welcome everyone. I am Adeshewa Josh and this is Africa Matters. Nearly half of Somalia's population, that's about 8 million people, are living through the worst drought in 40 years. So, what needs to be done? In Ghana, we talk to a painter who is using art to reduce stress and perform what he calls emotional surgery. I am Aris in Tampo in Boya, Cameroon, where I am finding out how Lucas' co children have been affected by the trauma of war. The United Nations says more than 700 severely malnourished Somali children have died in nutrition centers across the country this year. The Horn of Africa has seen four failed rainy seasons since 2020, and experts warn a fifth one could lead to famine in other parts of Somalia by the end of the year. Crops and millions of livestock have been wiped out due to extreme weather conditions, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made food prices unaffordable for many families. The UN says around one million Somalis have fled their homes in desperate search for food and water, as 7.8 million people, or about half of the entire population, face starvation. UNICEF warns more children could die due to a deadly combination of malnutrition and disease outbreaks. Funding for Somalia has increased in recent weeks, but aid officials say they need a billion dollars to offset the crisis. The unprecedented failure of four consecutive rainy seasons, decades of conflict, mass displacement, severe economic issues are pushing many people to that, the brink of famine. Today we're in the last minute of the 11th hour to save lives. The clock is running and it'll soon run out. If nothing is done, Time could run out for about 22 million people at risk of starvation in the Horn of Africa, according to World Food Programme's data. The unprecedented drought has not only hit Somalia, but Ethiopia and Kenya as well. The United Nations warns that the drought in Somalia could continue until March next year and lead to widespread famine. At least a million people have been displaced by the drought so far, and the influx of people into major cities like Mogadishu increases day by day, from where Ali Abdurrahman reports. After losing all her cattle and crops to drought, Khadija Abdi was forced to take her children and leave her home in search of food. She's among thousands of Somalis who have moved into camps for the internally displaced after their livelihood were destroyed by years without rain. I arrived here three days ago. I came from Buhakaba. We lost everything in the drought. I had 20 cows and they all died. Our land cannot produce maize. We need help. I came here on foot. Our first priority, food and shelter. God help us through this hardship. We need help. Women, children and elderly people are the most vulnerable. Hospitals are overwhelmed with thousands of malnourished children in need of an urgent treatment. At one Mogadishu hospital, doctor says that before the drought, two or three malnourished children were admitted each day. Now they see at least ten. The hospital is at full capacity with acute malnourished children from the IDP camps in Mogadishu. There are no vacant beds. We erected makeshift tents inside the hospital premises after all beds were occupied. We are working here around the clock. These children are the lack ones. Many others still suffer in droughted areas. The government tries to help, but its capacity is limited. Four consecutive rainy seasons have failed, and the UN says conditions are worse than during the 2011 famine, which killed more than a quarter of a million people. Somalia's Minister of Water says the coming months are likely to see below every rainfall, with temperatures exceeding 40 degrees Celsius. Farming has not yet been declared in Somalia, but it may be just a matter of time. Ali Abdurrahman, Africa Matters, Mogadishu, Somalia. Let's hear more from Gulaid Artan, director of the IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Center. He joins me from Nairobi. Thank you so much for making out time to speak with us. What is likely to happen to the people in Somalia and the Horn of Africa if the fifth consecutive rainy season fails? 
if uh, humanitarian uh, assistance doesn't come on time, we are likely to see one of the worst famine that we have seen in, in historical terms in, 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 in the Horn of Africa, uh, especially on the eastern sector of the, of the, of the region. Uh, and most probably uh, by end of this month to October, we'll see a really uh, biblical uh, proportions a disaster if uh, things are not uh, ad adverted. Are you concerned? Very concerned, very concerned. Uh, the, the last major drought that uh, this region has seen was uh, 2016 and 17, but uh, the major one was uh, the 10, 11, where around a uh, quarter million people lost their lives. But that was only a three-failed uh, uh, rainy season. Imagine now we have already four have failed, and the 51 is on course of also failing. Just let me come in here. To what extent is yeah. climate change responsible for this crisis? Because, you know, we can't even tell how much of climate change is responsible for this crisis and where the, the, the war, the political instability in Somalia or even the entire Horn of Africa, what role it is playing, you know? And then what can African countries do to mitigate themselves from the impact of this climate change that you, you were referring to earlier? It's, it's quite difficult to say what percentage is due to, uh, to climate change. Attribution is something else, but definitely uh, the droughts that we're seeing are much more severe. To give you an example, mm. uh, the, the, the last rainy season that has failed, uh, Somalia has seen the smallest amount of rain in over 61 years, over mm. 61 years. Uh, in, in, in the area that have been uh, 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 worsely hit, uh, like in the Bay area, the rain was uh, oh, less than 50% of what you expect uh, normally. Uh, what we need is to build a resilience of the region. And, 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 and most, of the, most of the region economy is actually built on, on agriculture and livestock things that depend on rain. That's right. So we need to change our, our economic uh, modes of brand, right. definitely. In the face of a looming famine, what can other African leaders do to support Somalia? My final question to you. Definitely any help that Somalia can get will be, is, is quite welcome. So now the, the, the most urgent help is humanitarian assistance to those that are uh, feeling the brunt of this drought. Thank you so much, Gulen Artan, Director of the EGAD Climate Protection and Application Centre, for speaking to Africa Matters. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. We have more stories coming up for you here on Africa Matters, including... I am Isaac Kaleji in Accra. I will show you how artworks like these are being used to help treat Ghanaians suffering from stress. Let's take you to Cameroon now, where thousands of children return to school on Monday in the English-speaking regions to begin a new academic year. But some children in the conflict zone of Boya are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. The government is now providing psychological support to local school children affected by the war, as Arasin Tampo reports. It's been nearly six years since an armed separatist conflict began in the English-speaking regions of Cameroon. For civilians, particularly children and teachers, the years have been one long nightmare. Abby Martha is only 12. She's struggling to cope with mental scars. She suffered when gunmen attacked her school. I was so scared and I was afraid that they would shoot us I was in school. So they were not wanted to see any child wearing school uniform. So I was just running. You know, I'll move the uniform. Martha survived, 
but many have not been so lucky. Henry Nyaba manages a government school in Ekondo Titi. One day, gunmen opened fire in a classroom, killing four students and one teacher. And after that, it has not been easy. Uh, passing just through the block where these incidents were committed creates a sense of fear in the, in the minds of the children. And uh, some even with weak minds find themselves shedding tears. Traumatizing is even an understatement. So I don't, I don't know how to qualify the psychological state of the students and the teachers. Uh, seeing their friends killed, seeing colleagues killed. Such stories have become ordinary in the Anglophone regions where separatists want to create an independent nation and have banned government schools from operating. Schools are now heavily guarded by troops. Human Rights Watch estimates that at least 700,000 children have been denied access to education since 2017. But Martha is defiant. She's returning to school against all odds and hoping to find sanctuary from the trauma. For most of these students, this is the first time they've been to school in six years. They say memories of death and destruction won't go away, but the government has initiated a new program to help them process their trauma. Teachers are now being trained to rehabilitate children psychologically and rebuild their resilience. Our teachers are ready to give the children this psychosocial support. In class, for instance, they make the children, uh, instead of you know, permitting them just stay quiet on their own and thinking about the parents who are not there or brothers or sisters who are missing, they have exercises that teachers use in the course of their lessons to get the children interact with others, tell their story, and feel free and know that others have that same story and that they are not the only ones and life has to continue. Can I say that? The government says the confidence and self-esteem of the children has grown since the program began. Martha hopes someday to become a pilot. But like many children affected by the conflict, it will take healing and hard work to make her dreams take flight. Aris in Tamfo, Africa Matters, Buya, Cameroon. More and more people are complaining of depression and stress caused by their busy lifestyles. In Ghana, a painter is trying to help such people using his artworks. He says he just doesn't want to showcase his work for their beauty, but to also provide a therapeutic experience. Isaac Kaleji met the painter in the capital Accra and filed this report. Echo Grimond has been painting for the past three decades. It's his passion and livelihood. He paints different African themes using traditional objects. But the way he paints with colors has turned his artworks from mere pictures into therapeutic tools. I have about 43,000 works. Okay, most of them are digital. Some of them are also, you know, uh, in acrylic form. When I draw, I communicate with or to the neurons. Let me put it this way. I talk to brain cells, that's it. And I have a way of doing it so that it calms the person's systems. Grimond created these paintings digitally with carefully crafted color combinations that he says puts observers into a relaxed mode. I want to slow down aging, you know, using my artworks. And I want people to be happy, stress-free, and not have suicidal thoughts and a whole lot to stay away from, you know. Um, like, I don't want them to fall into the trap of developing Alzheimer's in the future. Hey, Mr. Greenwood, good to see you. Yeah. Mauli Amen, a young tech entrepreneur, says he struggles with stress, but his tension disappears the moment he looks at the Greenwood's artwork. It's very relaxing and puts you to sleep really quick. I think it's better than um, traditional medicine or whatever the um, alternate medicine that basically you have to take pills and stuff. Health experts say 
the rate of hypertension in Ghana is high. Much of that is driven by the stressful lifestyles, especially in urban areas. And doctors say anything that can alleviate this is welcomed. We live in a very stressful environment and anything that can reduce stress, and particularly if it's not about going somewhere to go and, uh, uh, you know, either go and get a massage or go and do, you know, all those things, then maybe this is probably one of the easiest means of de-stressing. Uh, uh, and anything that distresses any adult, male or female, in Ghana and anywhere else in this world, must be good news. The stresses of everyday living conditions are a major health issue for many people in Ghana and around the world. And when it remains untreated, it can affect mental and physical health and can even lead to death. Echo Grimon believes his artworks can provide a positive therapy that brings relief to many people. The painter is now focusing on expanding his services to help more people suffering mental health conditions. Isaac Kaleji, Africa Matters, Accra, Ghana. You're watching Africa Matters, and here is a roundup of other stories making news across the continent. 60 trucks loaded with grain from Ukraine have arrived in Ethiopia. It's the first shipment of its kind to land on the continent since Russia's attack on Ukraine. The World Food Programme says that the supplies will help feed more than a million people at four a month. Prolonged droughts in the Horn of Africa and the civil war in northern Ethiopia has left 20 million people in need of food assistance. Scientists at the University of Oxford say they've developed a malaria vaccine that shows up to 80% protection against the disease. Vaccine trials on more than 400 children in Burkina Faso have been promising so far. The team is hoping to apply for vaccine approval from the World Health Organization once they get results from a larger trial on nearly 5,000 children due before the end of the year. Malaria kills more than 600,000 people globally, most of them in Africa, and despite the use of bed nets, insecticides, and drugs. Welcome back. African leaders have criticized their Western counterparts for shunning a meeting in Rotterdam called to discuss funding for climate adaptation projects on the continent. This year's African Union chairperson and Senegalese president, Macky Sall, said wealthy countries who are the main polluters globally should help African countries deal with the impact of worsening droughts and floods. The summit hoped to raise a total of $25 billion, but they only managed to raise $55 million. I think that the African Union, like most partners, has will. Only we can consider that this will is not sufficient, seen from our side, from the African side. But we can't say that they don't have will. But what is done is very little. What is done is not up to what is at stake. We just need countries to be uh, very active in actually implementing what they're saying. And of course, the absence of the leaders here uh, sends some signal you have Several leaders who came all the way from Africa uh, to, to participate uh, in this conference. And they were looking forward to seeing leaders from Europe and elsewhere. Meanwhile, the African Development Bank Group says the continent will need more than $3 trillion in investment to build climate resilience by 2030. African countries contribute the least to global heating and have the lowest carbon emissions, yet they remain the most vulnerable. In Nigeria, three teenage girls are taking action with their new mobile application. Sumaya Jalan reports. Telling hopeful stories about environmental activities. A louder voice for Africa in the face of the climate crisis. That's what the newly developed app Earth EXP is hoping to achieve. Its creators, three Nigerian teenagers, say Africa is sustaining irreversible damage despite its own minimal contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. They blame heavily polluting industrialized countries. We're actually very skeptical about it because even for the fact that Africa as a whole doesn't emit as much greenhouse gases like 
the Americans and other countries, we are largely affected. We are very, very largely affected by the floods, like she said. So severe floods happen in Africa and heat waves happen. So we are mostly affected by it. This app aims to change people's views by breaking down psychological barriers that prevent many from taking action on the environment. It uses hopeful stories about environmental activism, communicated through games, images, videos, and articles. Because we believe that when people um, play games, it actually affects the way they react to things. It affects the way they do stuff around them. So we created a game that if t f to help users to build city, and if they don't take care of that city, climate change will really, we also have an f effect on it. A U.S.-based nonprofit called Technovation picked EarthyXP as a regional winner in the 2022 edition of its international competition for girls. The team, who call themselves the Eco Elixirs, targets a potential market of about 24.3 million Nigerians who play mobile games. We decided to get people not so fully stuck on our app but stuck on our app enough to be able to develop a sense of a sense of action towards climate change, like developing thinking of the fact that yes, they can actually do something to relieve climate change. So it's basically to cause use a persistent strategy or persistent strategies to induce a behavioral change in our users, and in return we get a positive feedback towards climate action. Drought, heat waves, floods, and wildfires have affected millions of people across the continent. One app won't solve the climate crisis, but this one showcases what the next generation can do. Smeh Jalan, Africa Matters. We switch gears now as we head to Sudan, where facial markings are an ancient practice that were once common among some ethnic groups. They've become less widespread over the years, with many seeing them as archaic. Adam Amunu has this report. Khulud Masayad remembers when she had her face scarred. It was a custom for members of her Hadariya tribe. She was seven years old. Now in her 80s, the three lesions on her cheeks still remain. They took me to a man known to carry out facial scarring procedures, and I cried. They told me I should have these facial marks as they signify beauty. Many men are also marked for life. Their scars vary from small vertical or horizontal lines to shapes resembling a T or an H. Each one carries a meaning. There are facial marks for each specific tribe, meaning you can identify a child and his father by their facial marks alone and you can't tell to which tribe they belong. The practice can be seen elsewhere on the African continent. But everywhere, facial scarring has become less widespread over the years. Even those who've undergone the process say they're happy it's fast becoming obsolete. Generally speaking, I find this custom outdated and hopefully it disappears because it is a distortion and harms people for no reason. Khaloud, Babikar and Idris say they refused to mark their own children and they're likely to be the last generation to bear these marks of the past. Adam Aminu, Africa Matters. This week we explore Masawa, a port city in the northern Red Sea region of Eritrea. It's one of the world's hottest places with an annual average temperature of 30 degrees centigrade. Its mosque of the Companions dates back to the 7th century and is one of the oldest mosques on the continent. Let's take a look.
that's our show for this week. Please share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas on what you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Adeshawa Josh. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment and share. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you next week.